So, ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to all of you here. Um, today we're going to discuss management approaches for MPAs. Um, I have a, a very distinguished um, two panelists here with me, John Day from the Great Bear Reef Marine Park Authority, who's been working there for uh, many years and done a lot of different things in terms of making the Great Bear Reef arguably one of the most interesting and, and spectacular marine parks in the world. And Linwood Pendleton, who's been a chief economist at NOAA and now is uh, running the Oceans program at Duke University. And uh, both of them have promised me to give their sort of hard felt insights to how tough it is to be out there making MPAs work. I think, John, you will kick off and give us a few examples of some of the, the real life experiences you've had. Thanks, Carl. Can people hear me? Yeah. So, okay. Um, when we were asked to do this panel, we were asked to come up with three little phrases, and I'm not sure if they're up on the screen, but the three phrases that I decided to talk about were integrated management, ecosystem-based management, and adaptive management. And I chose those three terms because I thought they sort of epitomised what we've been doing in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we've been managing it now since 1975 when it came into law, and we've learnt a lot over the years. And I think the, the first one, integrated management, is one of the key lessons that we have learnt this is a very large area. Uh, for people who aren't aware, it's about the size of Italy or it's the entire west coast of uh, the US. And to manage such a big area, we can't do it alone. We're a federal agency, but we also work closely with the state of Queensland. And so when I use the word integrated management, I'm talking about integration across governments. And it's not just state federal. Uh, even though our jurisdiction stops at low water mark and the state then goes from low to high water mark, we also have to integrate with our local government and uh, have partners up on the land because so many impacts are coming down. So I see integrated management as being one of the core principles of what we do. Linwood, uh, would you give us uh, some of the insights that you have? Well, thank you. And um, I think this is the, the perfect setup because I'm an economist and if you don't know, economists are people who look at the real world and wonder whether it works in theory. So you're the <laughs> real world and I can be theory. Um, when Carl asked if we would talk about MPA management effectiveness, uh, what I decided I really wanted to talk about was ecosystem services. And if I had to do it again, my three um, key phrases would be ecosystem services, ecosystem services, and ecosystem services. We've talked a lot uh, over the last 10 years or so about how good MPAs are at producing ecosystem services and, and meeting human well-being. But by and large, we, we haven't done very much to explicitly design marine protected areas to produce ecosystem services. And there are some exceptions, and I think the Great Barrier Reef is one exception. I think we've done a pretty good job in uh, marine protected areas that serve the dive community and dive tourism. Uh, there is one uh, favorite MPA of mine in Puerto Rico, the Tres Palmas Marine Reserve, that was designed specifically uh, to protect a surfing resource. But if you look at all those other ecosystem services we talk about, we haven't really gone out and designed them to maximize spillover or maximize carbon protection or maximize shoreline protection or even really thought about how we would do that. Um, so this is one of these places where I'd like to talk more about management effectiveness and how we can be more effective. Uh, we've talked about um, the importance of having integrated and multi-sectoral MPAs, but I think there's also room to have MPAs that really are focused on specific marine ecosystem services. I like to think of things like carbon reserves and uh, MPAs that are designated specifically to protect shorelines and, and the like, and I think that's one way of scaling MPAs, MPAs up that we haven't considered fully. Um, so uh, that's something I hope people think about and I hope we think about this afternoon. I guess when it comes to economics, I, I'm often sort of struck by the fact that as a community, we keep on always looking at fisheries as the, the number one thing we need to motivate on an economics level. And of course, looking at the Great Barrier Reef, you know, we know what the economics are relatively well right now, yet this argument doesn't seem to cut it. Can, can, you've been in through this whole rezoning and all these other things. John, can you give, enlighten us a little bit about just the numbers in broad terms and how you see it, that we could change this debate? I'm not sure if I'd agree when you said uh, we know all about the numbers. We have an idea about some of the numbers, and I think the ones that Carl's alluding to, uh, we've had some work done by a, a group that works also for government, so we, the figures are well accepted. And Access Economics have, have done some calculations of what uh, some of the key industries, and tourism 
uh, is estimated at being worth over $5 billion Australian per annum to the uh, economy. $5 billion Australian. Um, that's almost $5 billion US, but not quite. Um, and the sort of equivalent, uh, using the same type of uh, assessment, they've looked at commercial recreational fisheries and research. And sure, they're worth hundreds of millions, but it's nothing in the order of magnitude of what tourism is. But the point I started off, Carl, we, I don't think we've done a proper ecosystem assessment. Uh, we certainly haven't tried to put a valuation on the, on the non-economic uh, issues. So what's the value of um, you know, species and, and uh, carbon storage and things like that? It's really hard to do. What we know is it's worth an awful lot of money. And uh, the other number I talk about is the, number, the management cost. We manage the Great Barrier Reef on a fairly small budget compared to the value to the... Uh, uh, Australian economy. I mean, it's, we're very well off, and when I hear some of my colleagues at, uh, func at uh, conventions like this talk about what their management budget is, I realise how lucky we are. But in actual fact, uh, we have a relatively small agency with a small, relatively small budget for the size of the job we've been given. Maybe we can have some examples from California. I mean, what, what, what's the order of magnitude figures there when it comes to fishing versus tourism, for example? Well, and, and so let me start by reiterating John's point, which is we have some of the numbers, and the numbers that we do have tend to be the commercial fishing numbers. And there's no doubt about the relationship between commercial fishing and the ocean. But even when we have tourism numbers, we don't know how much of that tourism is really dependent upon the sea. You know, if you look at Mont Saint-Michel, how much of that depends on the sea? Well, it's in the sea, but how much of it depends on the sea? Um, and in California, for instance, uh, we had numbers about commercial fishing. It's about $100 million a year in gross revenues, but we didn't have good numbers on recreational fishing or other kinds of uses like surfing until we went out and started collecting them. And we found out that recreational expenditures um, for recreational fishing are on the order of a billion dollars, and surfing may be uh, of the same order of magnitude. And that's just to scratch the surface. It doesn't include uh, kayaking and things like that. So generally, I think we tend to focus on things for which we have numbers. And the flip side of that, the opposite side of the coin, is we often work with numbers that are unrealistically large because we have to take the big pie and we don't know what slice of the pie depends on the sea. So I think that's a, a really good point. Now, why is it that economists haven't interested themselves so much about this? I mean, we, I worked for the World Bank for 12 years, and I was surrounded by economists, and they were doing all kinds of studies all over the place. Yet, very rarely did we actually get to the heart of this matter. Well, do you have any sort of theory and then would, why this is the case? Well, it's the concentration of the economy. So fishermen, uh, there are two things about fishermen that make them easy or easier to collect data from. The first is that they're regulated. And the second is that there are many fewer um, that earn more uh, revenue. And so with a lot of these other uses, recreational uses, second homes, homeowners uh, and property owners who live near the sea, there are many, many more of them um, who still benefit, but individually they may benefit less. So it's more difficult to get a handle, but it's not impossible in, in, in California, once again, where people um, have very high internet use. Uh, uh, Surfrider Foundation has been able to um, work with others up and down the California coast and Oregon to start collecting data directly from coastal users uh, using the internet. So we're able to crack this nut. Um. So economists are always interested in effectiveness and in making things more efficient and you know where are the gains to be made and, and if you look at the broader picture now of, of the marine protected areas what we're doing you know where are we going wrong in terms of the economics I mean my personal experience is one where I feel we, we as you know many of us come from a biological background tend to focus a lot about getting the monitoring right and getting focused on you know certain basics of understanding the system but we don't really tap into the flows of money that might be associated with it, or we're embarrassed about selling ourselves in a sense, so we don't really want to go down that path. Do you have some ideas about how one could improve effectiveness in economic terms? Well, I won't say we go wrong, but I'll say that there's a real reticence to charge user fees. Um, and we've seen where user fees are priced appropriately that they work. And this, the initial response is that, well, if I charge any user fee, not as many people will visit my marine protected area. And I think that may not be a bad thing. You know, we've all heard of the tragedy of the commons and it applies to people visiting your MPA as well. So I don't think we should be afraid of charging user fees. Uh, but I think we should also recognize that some MPAs are good um, for users and other MPAs are good for uh, ecosystems and ecological functions that may not generate a lot of the users. And we should start thinking of these networks of MPAs as portfolios 
where we can share revenues across them and not every MPA has to stand on its own feet. I think that sounds very reasonable. And even in a large area like the Great Barrier Reef, I presume you could also have things that are money makers and a lot of other things that are set aside for research where you get nothing. Well, we do have a, a user fee uh, in terms of uh, tourism pay, a, uh, what we call an environmental management charge. And it has gone up over a number of years and we still got 1.5 million tourists coming a year to the Great Barrier Reef. So this generates about $7 million in terms of money that comes directly to the Marine Park Authority for management and research. So that's certainly a good example of, of a user pays. Um, but we equally have, as you might know, a multiple use park and so we've got some zones where the tourists can't go and we've got some areas where, um, you know, the, about 95% of our tourism is actually concentrated in about 5% of the area. So there's so Which is actually quite a wise way of doing it because then you don't have too big an impact in lots of other areas. Although, you know, it's not nice to trash your own park, but I, I can understand why that makes sense. I mean, some other countries have problems with this. It's by law forbidden, for example, to charge people to go there. Particularly like in Mexico, if you have a lot of community land within the parks, it's very hard to do these things. And you might also have a thing where the money always goes into the central government, which means even if you get the foreigners to pay, uh, you're never going to see that money. So you're no, reason for collecting things is, is relatively limited. So I think that's another challenge that lots of countries need to grapple with and perhaps change the legislation if they want to have a chance of extracting that type of money out of it. So what are other types of economics that you think are not being considered in the right way when it comes to MPAs? Do you, do you have any other ideas? Well, uh, economies of scale, for instance. And so it, it's rarely um, the case that you sit down and, and you think about what are the costs and benefits of increasing the size? of your MPA. How far away should that outer boundary be? We tend to use jurisdictional boundaries or social boundaries or biological boundaries, uh, but we don't do the careful economics to say, you know, there is an optimal size. Um, what is that? What's the optimal level of enforcement? Uh, how many people, how many boats do you want to have out there? What's the optimal fine? You know, you can't put someone on every square hectare or uh, square kilometer of the ocean, but if the fine's big enough, you don't have to. Uh, so these are places I think we could think more. And of course, there's lots of new technology that you're going to use as well, and both in terms of radars or satellites or whatever, that can also help you see what's actually going on when you have a huge area like some of these mega MPAs that we've seen. So John, in terms of your enforcement, what part of the uh, Great Bear Reef budget is dedicated to enforcement issues? Well, I, I said the word integrated at the start. I want to stress it's not just our budget. We work, as I said, closely with the state of Queensland. So um, when people ask me how much we actually spend on managing the Great Bear Reef, I can't say the total amount. I can tell you what our budget is as an agency, and I can give you an indication of what the field management component of that is, which is pretty substantial, about $15 million a year. But again, I stress we're managing an area that's you know, huge, bigger than many countries. But um, we rely heavily on, on uh, coordinating other agencies to help us. So for example, as an agency, we don't own the single plane, but every day there are planes flying over the Great Barrier Reef, many of which are doing some of our work for us, helping us with our um, monitoring and, and uh, compliance. So uh, that's the sort of cost that comes to us that we don't actually have to, have to pay for. So the customs people are flying over. We've got boats from the Water Police and the Boating and Fisheries Patrol. So the, the different state agencies are also out there and we spend time training their officers to help us do our job. So how does that actually work in terms of economics? I mean, how do you get payments to these other agencies? How, wh wh you know, why would they bother in a sense? I mean, in some countries, you might have problems that, to get those type of uh, agreements in place and there might be a reticence from their part. I mean, for example, on fisheries enforcement, you know, if you're not actually fishing there, why should you bother? I mean, so, so do you have some ideas of how one comes around that? Well, again, it's not one size fits all. We have some formal agreements with some agencies. In other cases, it's less formal. But basically, everyone is, I think, uh, you know, working towards the same outcome, which is ensuring that the Great Barrier Reef is there for the future. It's recognising it's a multiple-use area, so it's not all lock-up, it's not all, you know, no fish. It's very much multiple use. So those agencies, as I said, they're out there on the water doing their business, but we've also trained and worked with them, so they're helping us with ours when, when they need to. But quite often, there is huge overlap. So the fisheries managers, it's in their, in their interest to have uh, some areas set aside, you know, no take. So we do work closely with those agencies and they, as I said, assist us as well. And how about civil society? I mean, can, are you getting civil society to buy in and, you know, what's their contribution, do you think, overall when it comes to enforcement? Well, I couldn't say uh, any sort of figure, but let me give you an example. We have about 14 million visitors on top of the 1.5 mi uh, tourists, uh, million tourists I mentioned. Those 14 million visitors are people who, because of such a long coastline, two and a half thousand kilometres, just enter the park and 
you know, using their own boat or whatever. And they're providing a huge role now in helping us uh, monitor and in some cases um, enforce. So we've now got a very effective system called Eye on the Reef where we're encouraging the public to report uh, issues to us. If they see you know, a, a, a biological phenomenon they want to tell us about, click it with their app, download it and we can get the information. But we're also getting them to provide us um, you know, their concerns about enforcement issues. And quite often fishermen who are doing the right thing will let us know about fishermen who aren't and that helps us a lot. So yeah, we rely heavily. As Lynn would say, we can't be everywhere, sorry. Uh, three, 345,000 square kilometres but there are virtually people out there every day, whether it's a tourist operator or fisherman, and if they can be a bit of eyes and ears for us, that certainly helps us with our job. Maybe part of it is monetizing that. Do you have well, so about that? let me make another comment, which is I, I think it's important to recognize that not all of civil society is, is equally expert at identifying an infraction. And, you know, so if you open it up to everyone, uh, you end up chasing a lot of um, false leads. And so uh, a great example in California is uh, rich people living in Malibu calling uh, you know, fish and game because they think the squid fishermen are spying on them. <laughs> in fact, they're out there using lights to catch squid. But on the other hand, I think commercial fishermen who do follow the law are excellent uh, monitors. And I think recreational uh, anglers are also very good monitors as well. As well. So you know, it's trying to figure out how do you harness civil society um, without creating a lot of animosity and a lot of conflict that's not necessary. Monetizing is difficult, but when you, when you come to these uh, different agencies that have different perspectives, uh, you may have to result to monetization, but you also just may have to go up the food chain far enough to find someone to make it happen. So we've seen in, in many developing countries, for instance, that tourism depends you know, entirely or in large part on the quality of the marine ecosystem, uh, and they're allowed to bring in money from the hotels, but they're not allowed to give it to the Marine Protection Agency. So that's a problem where money needs to, to move back and forth. But thinking of you know, how do you get other institutions to help you monitor, a good example, again, from California is that the lifeguards are out there counting people every day. And if they just changed the way they counted people to make a couple of notes about what people were doing, we'd have excellent monitoring data for much of the coast. Uh, but you know, if you, you go, they say, well, our job is to, to save lives and not to add two questions to our already busy day. So, you know, it's trying to figure out who in, in the, the chain of command can make this happen. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's also often a case of how can you actually motivate them and, you know, it might not be direct financial motivation, but there could be all kinds of indirect benefits that, you know, th there's a give and take in some sense. Now, in developing country settings, it can be much harder because you can't really rely on government agencies to take on certain types of roles. You often have you know, should we say unorthodox payment schemes and, and there's a number of other issues that come up. How do you deal with those type of situations? And what's the way around uh, those type of rather uh, insidious, tricky type of situations? And do you have some ideas about how economics can help there? Maybe we start with you. Well, the first thing I think is, is it's always culture specific. So uh, you have to figure out what works and what kinds of side payments happen in society anyhow. And, and it does a lot, and we should just be aware of that and recognize that this may be uh, an institutional structure that we haven't recognized, and we shouldn't be afraid to figure out how that might work. Um, but in other places, it may not work at all. You know, it depends on who owns the, the sea and who owns the coast. It's very much different if it's, say, the crown or the federal government or uh, a local community. So I, I think it can work, but I don't think it works in all cases. I think often a question case is how do you empower local people to actually have some sort of direct responsibility and sense of ownership also. And that, that can go a long way to also have them on your side. Not always, but there are, are cases of where that works. I mean, and, and I think often that's also about finding reasonable flows of money in the right direction to get around that problem. Yeah. And I think you have to balance that the, these resources in many cases are public trust resources and they belong to people outside of the local area. And so trying to balance that local control, local involvement with the idea that this is a public trust that may, by law, uh, belong to people outside of the local area. Or this might be a, a source of potential finance. How do you tap that public value to support local people doing the right thing? I mean, the other th thing we've found recently is that there are cases where private industry comes in and does something. Either it could be gas extraction, for example, and they build a plant on the coastline, or it could be tourism development, like in the Maldives, where pretty much all islands now have a de facto marine protection zone around them because there is no fishing there, really. 
Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, you know, how can we empower the private operator and actually educate them to the level where they're able to be decent managers because they can also be agents for good. So maybe from the Great Barrier Reef, you know, you have a lot of experiences with you know, a number of these islands, Lady Elliot and so on, which are operating a bit along those lines. Can you tell us a bit about it? Well, we have uh, virtually every tourist operator, whether they're on an island or just a roving operator in the marine park, is required to have a permit. And so one of the conditions of the permit is we require them to uh, make people aware of the rules and regulations and to help educate them. So we spend a lot of effort helping them understand the issues and getting them uh, more aware so then they can pass it on. So they're, again, a, a playing part of our role in educating the community. So the tourist operator at Lady Elliot, the Lady Elliot that you mentioned is a really good example. I mean, that guy is, or his company has decided to make their whole resort as green as they can, you know, solar panels and recycled uh, you know, sewerage systems and things like that. So they're doing a huge amount to minimise their footprint and to also educate all their guests. So he's a really good example of, of the sort of thing we want to see. But virtually all our tourist operators, as I said, because they're required to have a permit by law, we can help them educate. And so we also have a, a program where the good ones can get an, uh, accredited and, and can get a 15-year permit. A new one might have to get a one-year permit until he can prove that he's got the, the skills. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine this is a place where certification can be helpful as well as a one tool to sort of recognize good performance in a way. But maybe you have other thoughts about it. Well, so I, I was going to say certification is one thing. We, we tend to say, no, everyone's got to follow the same rules or you can't participate. But if you go be above and beyond, it should, there should be some way of, of saying that. And we know that the market um, will support a premium because there's the reason that people travel farther uh, to go diving because they can get better coral, um, more abundance of fish and fish diversity, things like that. But we don't tend to discriminate within, say, um, a marine network or marine park and uh, charge different fees for getting into different areas. And I think we could because not all of the marine park is the same in terms of its tourist potential. And uh, not all of the marine park is equally resilient to the impacts of tourists. So if there are places where you, you can't have as many tourists, um, but those tourists are willing to pay more, why not have that premium go to the reserve? I, I had the opportunity to visit a park in um, East Africa just a few weeks ago in, in, in Mozambique in, called Vamizi Island. And it's quite an extraordinary example where the local community has set aside a no-take fisheries reserve, which is around the tourism area. And in fact, the, the reef is very healthy and you know, the fish populations are doing great. There's a small amount of illegal fishing, but in fact, it's also policed by the community itself. So every morning when they've caught someone, they actually burn the gear publicly in the village and, you know, make your thing of it. And three strikes and you're off the island and you can't come back. And so there is sort of a, a certain amount of sanction uh, associated with it, but it's all done by the community itself. And I, I think it's an interesting model. Uh, I think the economics of it works in as much as this is what actually people come all the way out there to, to look at. So, so I think there is definitely a model to be had here in a number of other places. So you don't necessarily need to have a rich country setting to, to set that up. I think it works in developing countries. Perhaps the longest serving one is Chumba Island up the coast in Tanzania, where they've actually been running a, a very small reserve, but, but as an eco-lodge for quite some time. And, you know, the fish isn't great, but at least the corals are, are reasonably healthy. So I wanted to look at the, the third uh, pillar, uh, which beyond government and private sector is the civil society, and particularly our community of NGOs. Clearly, there are many cases where NGOs are also managing uh, marine protected areas or aspects or parts of marine protected areas. Do you have some good examples of that and, and how does that work? Well, perhaps if I can give another example of just NGOs. I mean, you talked about civil society. We recognise again, because we've got a large area, that we've got to get the community to help us manage. So we're investing a huge amount into uh, a thing called Reef Guardian Schools, which started off as a fairly small program where we got one school teacher on our staff to help develop some curriculum material which we then provided to school teachers. That whole program has now snowballed to where we've got over 120,000 school children along the Great Barrier Reef catchment. This is a 10% of the entire population in the catchment are in the Reef Guardian Schools program. So we've got kids from uh, preschool right through to secondary school, all developed, uh, all coming through the Reef Guardian Schools program, all passionate about the reef. They go home and they talk to their brothers and sisters and they educate their mum and their dad. So they're the, we're putting a huge amount into, uh, well, not a huge amount, we're putting a bit and we're getting a huge benefit from the community learning about it. It was so successful, we've actually taken it into other areas. So we've now got Reef Guardian Councils, 
We were working with local government to again raise their awareness and raise their uh, way of dealing with the, the issues facing them and, and affecting the Great Barrier Reef. And we've now taken into a Reef Guardian Fishers and Reef Guardian Farmers program. So that Reef Guardians thing, I think, is a really good way of getting other people empowered, understanding and helping us do our management. NGOs do play a major role, as you said. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time educating them. They're already pretty passionate and, and uh, educated. But they also have to recognise that you know, they're one of many stakeholders we have to deal with. And I think that's something else that through our various advisory committees, we have NGOs sitting on some of our advisory committees, but they're there sitting with the fishermen, with the traditional owners, with the other members of uh, various you know, researchers or, or industry. And so everyone's hearing others' perspective, and I think that's a healthy way of recognising that some people look at it through their own lens rather than through the broader, which is you know, what the community is about. And, and Linwood, could you give us some sort of order of magnitude figures when it comes to the contributions given by uh, non-governmental organisations, environment groups, uh, in their role within marine protected areas? Have you looked at that somewhere? No, no, I haven't, and I think it would be very difficult to do because there's some explicit contributions, but marine protected areas obviously don't exist in isolation from all the other marine management that happens. And so I think it's very difficult to disentangle what a, an NGO does or what NGOs do. And then also thinking about the NGOs moving in and out of the life cycle of an MPA. They may come in as the catalyst. They may fill a government role until government capacity is there. Uh, they may work in monitoring, even once the government's involved, education, all of these things. So I think it would be a monumental task to try to do. Well, it might still be a useful one. Uh, I'm sure there are graduate students out there who would be happy to do it. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit more um, talking to the areas beyond the park. I mean, we tend to be somewhat introspective and focused on the area, but of course there's lots of things going on and sometimes those impacts can be much greater and you know, what happens in society obviously influences a lot. So can you give a little feeling for what you mean with um, integrated management in this respect? Well, we, people may be aware we've done a, a fairly major um, forward-looking report in 2009 looking at the issues facing the Great Barrier Reef and trying to project an outlook. And having gone through that process, which was pretty rigorous in terms of its scientific underpinning, but it basically came out and said the factors affecting the Great Barrier Reef are primarily climate change and, and the associated issues, water quality coming off the land, coastal development and some unsustainable aspects of fishing, but mainly climate change and water quality right up there. So these are issues that are basically outside our direct area of jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction stops at low water. As I said, we work closely with the state of Queensland who look after low to high water and areas around islands, for example. But we have to work closely with others, you know, partners and, and with local government, as I said, up into the catchments and with industry groups, for example, the sugarcane industry, to get them to recognise the impacts they're having and the downstream impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. Climate change is a, a difficult one. That's a global issue. But our approach is we can help build resilience by taking some of the other pressures off the Great Barrier Reef and allow it, those areas to, to uh, cope with climate change. So that's why we've got the new network or a relatively new network of no-take areas. That's why we're putting so much effort into trying to address water quality coming off the land. So in reality, most of the issues facing the Great Barrier Reef are outside our direct jurisdiction. And in fact, this whole uh, question of resilience, I think, comes also to the heart of how you as a manager need to look for coping with all kinds of unforeseen consequences. I mean, the, the striking thing I have in my relatively short lifespan is to how many times life throws us curved balls that we weren't at all prepared for. As a community, we've sort of constantly been chasing behind rather than being ahead of some of the issues. So it's uh, you know, heartening to know that you're at least looking into the future uh, I guess the, the bottom line is, you know, even with the best crystal ball, we, we might not always be prepared for what comes. So that, in my mind, really um, argues to have good adaptive management, dynamic sets of dealing with issues, and really be good at coping with all kinds of changes. The more rigid you are, the more structured you are from, shall we say, a, a um, sort of stable or, or static way of looking at it, the more likely you are to be, be in a worse position to deal with those types of changes. Let me go back to this inside and outside of MPAs. And, and I think there are two places where we really need to do a better job of focusing on what's going to happen outside of the MPAs. The first is when we take management actions within the MPA, we need to spend more time thinking about what's going to happen outside of the MPA. And uh, a lot of what we say is going to happen on, on both sides tends to be a lot of hand-waving, so we'll maybe overpromise spillover or under-promise uh, the effects of displacement. And we just need to be more serious and scientific about that. Um, and to take that a step further, I think we need to design so we maximize the 
positive things that can happen. So if we say there's going to be spillover and fish depend on hard substrate, don't put all the hard substrate in the MPA or in the reserve. Make sure some of it's available outside of it. Um, but the second side of that is if we're going to do a good job of managing these MPAs for people, then we are going to have to collect data inside and outside MPAs because there are lots of things that are happening to people that are independent of your MPA. And recreational fishing may be going down everywhere because of social and demographic changes. So if you just measure it in your MPA and you can't control anywhere else, uh, you don't know what's going on. Um, and, and that happens a lot. And we tend not to spend enough time outside of MPAs. Thanks a lot. Any parting words, John? Well, just to finish off on Linwood's comment about, uh, you know, don't promise about spillover. When we set up our network, we had no idea of the, the extent that we can now prove scientifically. But we said to, to fishermen when we thought there'd be benefits, we stressed them what we did wasn't about fisheries, but that we thought there would be benefits to fisheries. And for people who aren't aware, we can now prove scientifically that the um, larvae and, and eggs from the green zones are ending up in the blue zones, and, and many of the fish also are swimming out. So we can prove that through genetic tagging and things like that that we couldn't do when we did the zoning. So that's a really nice story. The other point I just finish off is you mentioned adaptive management. Um, again, we used the best available science when we did our zoning, but even that was 10 years ago. We, today we know a lot more, and so uh, you know when we put our network over the top of the new information, because we used a precautionary and a systematic approach, we've actually picked up a fair bit of you know, habitats we didn't have mapped and some new species. So a precautionary approach, not waiting for perfect science, getting on, and then, as you said, adaptively managing as the new information comes on board. So thank you very much to our panel. A round of applause. So I just wanted to mention, I think there's a couple of events this evening which could be quite exciting. Hopefully they get to start on time today. Uh, the first one is the Blue Marine Foundation has made a movie of the uh, Chagos, currently the largest no-take zone. It's the blue heart of the Indian Ocean. I think that will be really exciting. I had an opportunity to go out there and it's one of the most splendid places on this earth, so I think it'll be really good to see. And uh, Pew Charitable Trust is also talking about Pitcairn, another one of the UK uh, overseas territories which uh, is currently going through the process of, of looking at marine protection. And we have quite a contingent here from Pitcairn. It's not that often you get to see someone who actually comes from there, so I think that'll be a great event as well. So warmly welcome and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>